I'd like to start this video with a quick disclaimer. I'm actually a big fan of the YouTuber in question here, so please don't read this as some sort of total condemnation of him and his work. But I believe he is exhibiting some core errors of the modern world, and I believe it's important to address them. So, for those of you who are unaware, Gab, which has promoted itself as a pro-free speech alternative to Twitter, has recently banned pornography from its website. Gab's founder has also been on a campaign to bring attention to the harm caused by pornography, and he has promoted criminalizing it. This has sparked outrage by many pro-free speech YouTubers who see this as a violation of this principle. Louis Levi is one such YouTuber. He made a video calling conservatives who claim to promote freedom hypocritical if they also supported criminalizing pornography. He further argued that prohibition itself was anyways ineffective. If you look at the 20th century, and whether we're talking about alcohol, whether we're talking about any form of narcotic, regardless of what we're talking about as it relates to prohibition and the federal government, give me the example that shows that federal prohibition leads to a reduction in consumption. Show me that standard, because whether it's cocaine, marijuana, alcohol, or any other narcotic that you can, or any other vice that you can give me, show me the example that is not going to result in a massive black market and no reduction in consumption at all. This controversy goes straight to the heart of one of the 20th century's biggest pieces of mythology, and those last few lines from Louis sum it up perfectly. Don't you know, we can't ban socially harmful behaviors because it will just cause a massive black market and it won't even reduce consumption. Alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, prohibition is just impossible. It just doesn't work. We of course all know the story of American prohibition. A bunch of uptight Protestants banned alcohol and it didn't even work at all because everyone just went to speakeasies and after a decade of total failure, prohibition was repealed and everything went back to normal. As Louis said, and no reduction in consumption at all! This is one of those stories we've all known since a young age, and like many of those stories, it's pure mythology. It's something that constrains the mind. It's something that's there to tell us, oh no, don't go there, don't try that, don't try to prohibit vices. It won't even work. But you'd probably find greater truth value in a story about Zeus than the conventional stories about prohibition. At least they might have an accurate message. Despite the popular narrative, the facts about prohibition are not even really contested amongst most of the relevant experts. Prohibition did cause a significant reduction in alcohol consumption. It's impossible to get exact numbers on this, but according to one analysis by Mirren and Zwiebel, two libertarian economists who were very anti-drug prohibition, alcohol consumption dropped to 30% of pre-prohibition levels. And in the later years of Prohibition, it rose to 60 to 70% of pre-Prohibition levels. So, even just by going by the highest number there, there was a 30% drop in alcohol consumption. That's a far cry from... And no reduction in consumption at all! What Louis says here is just a myth, but it's a myth that many people believe. And the 30 to 40% reduction is really undercutting get the real picture a bit. Because, prior to Prohibition, Alcohol consumption wasn't just staying steady, it was actually increasing and increasing rapidly. For example, from 1900 to 1913, beer production went from 1.2 billion gallons to 2 billion gallons. And over the same period, the production of tax-paid spirits grew by about 50%. So, on the eve of prohibition, it would have been reasonable to expect that alcohol consumption would have continued to grow even more. So. When, in the later days of Prohibition, we see that alcohol consumption was lowered by either 30 or 40 percent, that's not even counting the amount of growth that would have otherwise occurred if not for Prohibition. And there were also tangible health benefits. By 1929, the amount of deaths from cirrhosis had fallen to one-third of pre-Prohibition levels. So, here's your example, Louis. Real benefits, real reductions in consumption from prohibiting a vice. American Prohibition is proof that it is possible to significantly reduce the use of a vice if the will is there. I'm not saying that it was a good idea, that's a totally different argument. But, legal prohibition reduced consumption. It's possible. It can happen. We can do it if the will is there. The liberal, and I mean liberal in a broad sense here, reaction to criminalizing vices really is amazing. Just throw up your hands and say it's impossible to reduce the use or consumption of a vice. There's nothing we can do. 
There are plenty of other examples, such as China. Have you ever heard of the opium wars? Have you ever heard that the entire country was hooked on opium at one point? It's only a slight over-exaggeration. It was estimated in 1906 that 25% of all Chinese men regularly consumed opium. What would the liberal answer to that be? I know I'll have libertarians telling me, but it was only because of the government in the first place, because of the British, that they were selling them opium, that they were hooked on it. Yes, that's true, but we don't live in the Yankap utopia. So I'm not interested in libertarians telling me, oh, just get rid of all government and you won't have the problem anymore. So, Louis, so liberals, what would have the answer have been to a country where 25% of all men were addicted to opium? Because the Chinese answer was simple, ban it. And what a surprise, it worked once they had an effective government that could enforce that ban. Mao and the Communist Party had an extensive anti-opium campaign. They executed drug dealers, and they managed to get opium use to a tiny fraction of what it once was. Now, mass opium use just isn't a thing in China. What a surprise! A government ban actually worked. Now, I know, I know what the response will be. You're promoting Mao as a good example? Well, tell me, tell me, liberals, seriously, what's the response? How would you have fixed 25% of a country being addicted to a drug? Because we have a real-world example where this was a real problem and prohibition really worked. So where's the liberal example? What's the liberal solution here? Do we just throw up our hands and just say, oh, prohibition never works? It did work, and I know better than most people how awful Mao was. But we can look at this, and we can say, this was a good program. This was a good thing. That 25% of the biggest country in the world is no longer addicted to opium. This point really can't be stressed enough because it goes straight to the heart of 20th century mythology. Government can reduce the use of vices through effective prohibition. Where it fails, it fails because of lack of enforcement, lack of will. We see the same thing in other countries. In Singapore, where they also execute drug dealers, they have one of the lowest opioid abuse rates in the world. 30 per 100,000 compared to America's 600 per 100,000. Now, onto the issue of pornography in particular. Pornography is not speech, period. It's simply categorically different from speech. In America, in the land of the First Amendment, you can go to the literal town square and you can speak whatever you want. You can say gay marriage is bad. You can say gay marriage is good. You can even say you hate gay people. Those are all types of speech. You can even stand in the town square and say the n-word without legal repercussions because that's speech. You, however, cannot go into the town square, expose your genitals, and start pleasuring yourself. Is this a violation of your freedom of speech? No, because this is an action. It's a sex act. It is not speech. Is this the world you would like to live in, Louis? Would you like to live in a world where homeless men could pleasure themselves on public buses and the authorities couldn't do anything about it? If not, why not? If sex acts are speech, why is it such a special type of speech that can be shared as much as you want online, but you cannot do this type of speech in public? You have two logically consistent options here. Either sex acts are available anywhere in public at any time, or you can admit that sex acts are simply not speech. Louis also says that it would take Chinese-style internet censorship to ban internet pornography. Is this really true? You know, we ban things on the internet currently, right? Plenty of things, from selling cocaine, to prostitution, to threats of violence. You can't legally do those things on the internet. Now, yes, they are still present, but if we didn't have prohibition against these things, do you think they would be more or less common? And there are already plenty of websites that are practically porn-free already. In the thousands of hours I've spent on YouTube, I've seen maybe one or two naked bodies on this website. Is it really impossible to expect a similar standard from other websites? Right now, I could find pretty much any type of currently legal pornography in 30 seconds. Is it really so much to expect it to be just a little more difficult? Yes, there will always be a way for people that really want to find these things to find them. But is it really beyond our reach to just make it difficult to find these things? Just because there will always be cracks isn't an argument to have a hole instead. Louis also says that this is just another example of gynocentrism, as his title says, women and children most affected. Well, I guess he has me on the children part. Yes, I care about children being exposed to hardcore sexual content, but personally, I'm not overly focused on women. Sure, pornography is very harmful to women, but my main focus isn't them. Really, it's the boys. 
because the status quo on pornography is that the average age for first exposure to pornography is between 11 and 13. And that is just the average, meaning half of all boys are exposed even younger. That is, as far as I'm concerned, mass society-wide sexual abuse of boys. 11, 13-year-old boys, they cannot sexually consent. They're supposed to ask their parents before setting up a Neopets account. I know Louis and people like him can understand sexualizing children when it comes to the drag queen story hour stuff or trans kids. So, why can't you see it here? Because... Our need to have unlimited, unrestricted, immediate access to the most degenerate types of pornography possible means that we are allowing young boys to see this same content. And yes, yes, I know what the response will be. If their parents were good parents, then they wouldn't allow them to view this type of stuff. They would monitor their screen time, etc. Well, I don't just care about the children that have good parents. I care about children at a society-wide level. I don't want society-wide sex abuse to occur. And that's what's happening now. We are sacrificing the innocence of our boys on the altar of needing immediate, unrestricted access to any type of pornography. Thank you everyone for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, and most importantly, please share this video with anyone who you think might find it interesting. Bye.